Hi, I'm Meg Riley here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where it hasn't been above zero in a few days. I start to look a little desperate in this hour of The View. We have a number of special guests with us today, and we'll introduce them. But first, let's have the regulars go around and say hi. Hi, this is Aisha Hauser, and I'm in Seattle, Washington, where it's overcast and a little rainy. It has been sunny, though, so we just have a little overcast today. Hi there, I'm Patrice Curtis. I am in Washington, D.C., where the wind chill is zero, so we're having weather that's uh, somewhat like Meg's, but still, I know, still a little warmer. <laughs> now, I, I think once you hit a certain point, it's all deep freeze, really. Hi, I'm Bob LaValle uh, in Buffalo, New York, uh, where it's going to be minus nine today, wind chills in the minus 40s, uh, and actually, we finally had, uh, or, or unfortunately, just had a fatality from the wind chill, so it's a little scary up here. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's not a good time to be out on the street, that's for sure. I think all of us are thinking of people without warm homes. Um, we have Nori Ross joining us now. Uh, at least part of her face is on my computer. Nori has been having a few technical difficulties, and those may continue. Nori has been one of the bloggers under the sexuality tag um, and is also a minister in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where people like to talk about sex in very different ways than Unitarian Universalists do. And today's topic for The View is sexuality. I'll let our next guest, who's sitting here beside me, introduce. Hi, uh, my name is Gio Ronskirali, and I'm a high school student interested in comprehensive sex ed. And we also have with us Millie Malarkey, who I met in 1989, and she already was a veteran uh, at this, doing uh, about your sexuality starting in 1977 and moving into our whole lives, the UU sexuality curriculum. And um, she also ended up through that working at Planned Parenthood, as one thing leads to another. We're also joined by Melanie Davis, the UUA OWL Program Associate, who's also adjunct faculty at Moravian Theological Seminary. And Melanie, it'll be fun to hear what, how your sexuality education fits into your seminary educating as well. But before we start talking about sexuality, anything else going on for anyone that you want to talk about? Patrice, I believe you took a rather uh, dramatic trip this week. We'd love to hear a little bit about that. You are muted right now. Yep. Uh, yeah, a group of us from All Souls Church went down to Raleigh, North, North Carolina to participate in the Moral March. And as usual, uh, we came away with um, just great inspiration uh, and feeling blessed that we're able to, you know, sort of go down and, and witness what North Carolinians are struggling with every day. And, um, you know, the Reverend William Barber was... <laughs> on fire as usual. I mean, he is amazing. If you've never had the chance to uh, see him live, try. And if you haven't had the chance to see him at all, he's, uh, I'm told he's all over YouTube, though I haven't done to Oh yeah, I've never seen him live, but even on YouTube, he is amazing. I tell you, he brings folks together. He had times where he was prophetic. He had times where he had us uh, actually engage with each other, you know, look at each other, see each other, embrace each other, support each other. Um, he really has it uh, going on, and uh, any preacher or preacher to be, I suspect, could learn a few things from watching him. So it's it was really a fabulous uh, and very quick trip. So Patrice, it, you took a bus down from All Souls DC. Is that what you did? Yeah, we all carpooled. Actually, oh, you carpooled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looked like I saw on Facebook that Charlotte took a bus up. Were there a lot of Unitarian Universalists there from beyond North Carolina, all over North Carolina? I would say this Moral March, I wasn't at last year's, but from what I understand, this Moral March was smaller. Um, I think it's partly it's a non-election year, you know. I suspect that next year is going to be um, huge again. I would say that there were probably about not great at estimating numbers, but I'd say there's at least a hundred 
I feel I feel confident saying there were at least a hundred U's, and there were probably I know they said there were thousands and thousands, but I would say if there were more than three to five thousand, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be I'd be somewhat surprised. So as usual, percentage-wise, we really turned up. There were a lot of Carolinians there. Uh, I have to admit that most of the folks that I saw were, most of them were actually from North Carolina. I think we might have had the largest contingent out of state. Oh, interesting. And what yeah. were the main issues that they were talking about this time? Was it, was it the same? What? The same thing, voting rights. Um, they also just talked about, uh, there was some mention, of course, of the three uh, students that were that were murdered, the three Muslim students that were murdered. So there was support for that. There's also support for um, health care, you know, just undermining health care available for everybody. So, yeah, those were the, the big issues. There's, uh, you know, there's uh, a civil rights legislation that is being, uh, I think it's already been introduced in North Carolina, so there was some mention of that. Just a general, I would say the overall feeling was just this continued sort of general erosion of racial justice, sort of across the board. Um, and then we had the opportunity to, uh, to delve a little bit deeper uh, into what's going on in North Carolina, the October apparent suicide, but really folks think it was a lynching. Um, a little bit, uh, uh, I do not remember the name of the town, but it's, it's a small town sort of north of Charlotte in the more rural area. Uh, so there are some things going on that it's hard for us who don't live in North Carolina to hear about, but our UU brothers and sisters are really living in the midst once you get out of Charlotte. Apparently there's, you know, they are, they feel very sort of vulnerable and somewhat more exposed. There's, yes, there's a lot of conservative going on. I think the piece that I heard that was very interesting recently is that there is an organization, I believe it's called um, Civitas, that is actually paying for journalists to work with the, some of these small uh, newspapers in some of these small towns who are actually writing uh, uh, conservative articles. So these small newspapers cannot afford them. So there's this third party that that is paying for the salaries. That is so often the case. Oh. Yeah, and some of the writing, um, I've been told, it harkens back to sort of the 1950s. It has that real racial feel to it. So things are kind of tense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that moral movement is spreading throughout the U.S. and needed in many other places. I think Wisconsin's going to really need some morality over there with Scott Walker slashing uh, budgets outrageously. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for going. Thanks for, uh, thanks I for felt, representing us. Yeah, I, I felt you know, I felt blessed to be able to to do some teeny weeny tiny little piece, which is just show up on a right show up on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, I mean, but but it means a lot. So it means a lot to them to know that you know we are all here. So anybody who'd like to drop a line to any of the Charlotte churches, say we're with you, or go to their Facebook page. I know that they'd really appreciate it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Asia, what's going on out your way besides uh, unseasonably great weather? <laughs> Yeah, things are sprouting. Um, did you all see uh, Democracy Now! that uh, Amy Goodman lifted up the Sanctuary Church in Denver? And she interviewed, yeah, she interviewed a union that. minister. Yeah, it's online, so I would definitely, actually one of our congregants uh, brought it in to show us um, last week, so it was pretty cool. And they interviewed the associate minister there, and Arturo, who's living in the Denver, um, is it the first Unitarian Church in Denver? So that was really neat so um, and and once we start talking about sexuality I do hope we get to talk about uh, the Fifty Shades of Grey because there's been a lot of controversy and yes I did see it judge all you want and I did read the book so I told my children it was for research because we're involved in OWL and I needed to make sure that you know I knew what the fuss was about so um, well good I'm glad you I'm glad you did that at research that'll benefit us all <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're getting comment on it, you you know you ought to yeah slash read it so yeah exactly yeah. 
Well, um, I was going to mention that Jorge Espinel, who does the Spanish language ministry at CLF, is reaching out to, is engaging people to reach out to uh, the folks in Denver there, and I, I love that. And he, you know, something just interesting, he met online with 19 Unitarian Universalists in Cuba. I just think that is so interesting. So, you know, this global thing. I want to hear more about this. Yeah, well, there's a there's a trip of UUs going down to Cuba, so they'll have something to say when they get back. I think I think that'll be really interesting to hear from them about what UUism looks like in Cuba. So, well, let's get to our topic for the day because there's a lot to talk about. So um, we wanted to talk, let's start, Nora, with you, because you keep getting thrown out. <laughs> I want to get you while you're here. You've been part of the blogosphere about sexuality. Can you describe what you, you bloggers are doing right now about sexuality? Well, um, it started with one blogger who wanted to write about sex and wondered if that was a good idea or not a few months ago, and we kind of decided to... Uh, choose a month to all of us kind of in solidarity blog about sex, sexuality, and it's been very interesting. There's been a lot of different posts from um, uh, people coming out as heterosexual uh, monogamous and uh, how that, how sexuality plays a role in their marriage to uh, folks looking at different aspects of sexuality uh, and um, and to taking a look at how our sexuality is sacred. I've done four posts so far myself, uh, and the first two were on different ways we can view sexuality and uh, it, that there's more than one flavor of it. The third one was a chapter actually from my doctoral thesis on sexuality and the church. And the fourth one I just did was in response to one of my readers who wanted to know how to heal from sexual shame, from allowing things to happen to her uh, or participating in things as a young adult that she has a lot of shame about. So there's a lot of different things going on out there, and it's very exciting. I know Lynn Unger, who's uh, on CLF staff and one of the bloggers, said, boy, if you want to get a lot of readers, blog about sex. <laughs> she said her blog just got more hits than anything she's ever written before. Um, is that what you're finding as well with your blog and other people's? Absolutely. I always joke about my 10 faithful readers, but I think I'm up to at least 12 or 13 now. <laughs> There's been a, it's been certainly my, my most popular posts have been the, the, the recent ones in this month, definitely. Interesting. Well, um, I think it's great that's happening. That's a real witness, I think, for Unitarian Universalist values about sexuality. So Millie, I mean, you've been doing this since 1977. That's incredible, first of all. Well, thank you. Doing that. Um, well, I think that the um, just this this reaction that people see the word sex in something and they're they're drawn to it. Um, it certainly led me to have a very skewed vision of teaching because the, the students were all paying attention, and um, the AYS was so revolutionary in its day and then the OWL came along which just expanded it in so many different ways and I love that there's been a new expansion of the 7-9 so that you know people will say well nothing changes it's you know sex is sex but um, who we are as a community changes and the thing that I find most exciting are the people who become facilitators and anybody watching this who has ever thought about becoming a facilitator I would highly encourage you um, my partner who's 72 had decided for the first time to take the training uh, last year and is te teaching the 7-9 this year and is just blown away by how much he's learning and, and gaining from uh, contact with the students so I think um, I think the thing I love most about the curriculum is that the facilitators are just that. They're not teachers. And as facilitators, they help the kids learn, but they also learn from the kids. And there's just a lot of joy going on, as well as learning. <laughs> so why did you become a sex educator? Like, What drove you to... Oh, well, um, I was one of those uh, 50s girls who uh, came from the dark ages and uh, married a man um, that was my childhood sweetheart. He has since died. But um, when, my when my children became um, teenagers, I realized 
that I was a dinosaur, that they were dealing with a world of sexually transmitted diseases, that I had just gone la 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 because it wasn't relevant to my life. I was heterosexual, monogamous, you know, I didn't have to worry about it, which was a great advantage for me personally, but it wasn't a great advantage for me as a mom because I really didn't know how to help. And that was why I initially took the AYS training and then um, just got hooked. And so when we moved to Seattle, I began volunteering at Planned Parenthood and then went on to have a 30-year career teaching with Planned Parenthood. And um, based on my work at church youth group, I started a teen council at Planned Parenthood where we have peer educators, which is now being replicated all over the country. Is that, um, I was actually asked to do that uh, in Minneapolis, it's called KISS? Mm -hmm. Well, it's different, it's called yeah, different things in like, different places, yeah. Because I just heard about that, so that's awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous program and it not only helps the, of course, the people who learn the most are the kids who become the teachers with us, the peer educators. But um, it also helps them really appreciate how valuable they are to their community, not only their, their peers, but their parents, their friends, their parents' friends. It's a great program. That's great. Is there a central place to go to, to learn about uh, where the facilitator trainings are happening, or is it just... Yeah, I think we're going to go to Melanie for that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, that's Melanie. Great. You, yes, um, sure. And tell sure. us about what you do, and does it include the facilitator trainings? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm the um, OWL program associate for the UUA, um, and the United Church of Christ has an equivalent of me. Amy Johnson is their OWL program coordinator. Um, and um, to answer the first question about where to find out about trainings, if you go to uua.org slash re slash owl that's where all things owl are posted and <clears throat> there's a, a Google calendar for facilitator trainings um, sometimes people will say ah there's nothing you know near me and that's that you know they keep getting added so you have to keep going back and and looking for new trainings um, and if there's absolutely nothing in your area that um, is convenient to you then you can talk to your district and maybe there are other congregations that have expressed interest in hosting a training and, and one can actually be set up. <clears throat> so in my role, um, I actually came on board um, just after the revision of the, sec the grade seven to nine curriculum came on. And um, so I was one of the developmental editors for that, which, oh, is huge. <laughs> it's this, you know, massive, publication. Um, <clears throat> um, so we've shepherded that, shepherded that through, but my job also includes being a liaison between the OWL users and the UUA, um, and we actually work, we also work with the um, Canadian Unitarian Council folks. Um, so we have listservs for them, <clears throat> we have um, I'm a liaison for the trainers, so we have a, a trainer Facebook page, we do trainings of trainers. Um, we do the UUA does not host any facilitator trainings itself. Usually, the districts or congregations do that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and then I do a lot of uh, conference speaking. Um, Amy from the UCC and I just spoke um, in December at the National Sex Ed Conference about the Owl revision. Um, we just submitted a proposal to speak uh, about sexuality and faith at the Parliament of World Religions, which will be in Salt Lake City this year. So we're spreading the word about um, OWL, um, but also more generally about sexuality in a sense of where your values are and, and living your values through your sexuality. So what were some of the key reasons that the revisions were needed? What were some of the new pieces in the revisions or the revised, significantly yeah. revised pieces? Well, the original was published in 1999, and then it was updated. All the statements of fact were updated in uh, 2005. So things like some new contraceptive methods, statistics on sexually transmitted infections, and that kind of thing. But um, young people are different now than they were in 1999. There are a lot more influences, and so we have um, the 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 form. The first edition was 27 workshops. This one is 25 workshops, 
and um, we did a little consolidating so that we could add new topics. We have bullying and bystander responsibilities because there's so much of that going on with um, body shaming and orientation shaming and sexual identity, gender, tra you know, there's so many instances that relate to our sexuality where bullying occurs and so we added a workshop on that. Um, we added a workshop on sexuality, social media and the internet um, to help youth understand the implications of text, texting, sexting, Facebooking, you know, using all these online platforms that can really create a sense of, of, of fear and hope and unsafety um, because you want to be part of that community but sometimes your sexuality is being used against you. Um, another workshop we have is um, consent education because there's a lot out in the world and, and public schools are talking about rape prevention and harassment and things but they don't talk much about how to say these are my boundaries and this is when I'm feeling like I can say yes to this and yes to this, but I'm saying no to that. So consent, the consent education workshop really helps the youth see what consent means. Um, we have a workshop that's new this time on communicating with a sexual partner. Um, and one of the things that I like about this edition is we have, um, the first edition was written all by Pam Wilson. This one, Pam is the um, main author, but we brought in a lot of topic specialty um, experts. And um, one of the things that was really important to me to do is to draw this, this thread through all the workshops so that when we get to the end and we have Pam's workshop on communicating with a sexual partner, she's using referring back to an activity that was in Alvernacchio's workshop on healthy relationships. So there's, you know, there's, there's bits and pieces that the youth can fit together from all the different, um, different workshops. Oh, there's also a new, <coughs> excuse me, in um, the new sexuality in our faith, because uh, each of the OWL curriculum, the OWL is secular, and then sexuality in our faith is bringing the UU and UCC values into it. Um, we have a standalone workshop in sexuality in our faith on pornography. We the reason that we put it in sexuality and our faith instead of owl was because we wanted to put it in the context of our religious values, not just make it a totally secular workshop. So anyone who wants that, they would ha then have a 26 unit program, um, but they would need to buy the sexuality and our faith manual, um, which will be out in April. I um, had no idea that was the case. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I, I did not realize that that the OWL curriculum was explicitly secular. Yeah. I always assumed it was, you know, this, it was UUism incarnate. No, and, and, and the reason that it's secular is because we want the community to be able to use it. So um, there, are, there are OWL values, responsibility and self-worth and sexual health and social and justice and inclusivity are OWL values that certainly Unitarian Universalists and the United Church of Christ denomination you know, would agree with those values, but they're not religious values, those are OWL values, and so those run through the entire curriculum. When we get to the sexuality and our faith um, com companion to OWL, that's when we say, okay, so here's a, here's a workshop on um, gender identity. Um, which, which of our UU principles will you know, will come to mind when we talk about that. Or um, in the UCC half, they might say, so of the, you know, biblical of Jesus's teachings. You know, which one of those would I, would would come into play when we're talking about respecting people for who they are? So, um, you know, you can't do that in a secular publication. Um, but we have owl is being used in in some uh, charter schools um, by other faith traditions, um, by homeschoolers. Um, a friend of mine is a sexuality educator for Planned Parenthood in Nebraska and she actually uses some OWL materials in two correctional facilities where she works. So, um, you know, you, you can't do that if it's a, if it's a religious um, curriculum. So, you mentioned living your values through sexuality. Um, can you speak more about that? Sure. Well, 
for example, as, as a UU, I'm a lifelong UU, and as a UU, it's very important to me to, um, to honor people, who, whoever they are and wherever they are in their journey, whether their journey is spiritual or exploring their sexual identity um, or their, their types of relationships that they want to have. And that's, that's a core part of my spirituality is respecting that in other people. And <clears throat> so part of my work as a sexuality educator is... I don't say I'm spreading the word of you, you when I do it in a secular setting, but but it is. I, I teach I teach with that core value in my heart when I'm teaching other people about sexual identity um, and intimacy and um, sensuality. I'm thinking, how can I teach this in a way that respects wherever that person is? So this question is for Asia. Um, do you think Fifty Shades of Grey exhibits you, you values? I, I haven't seen the movie or read the book, so this is for um, anyone to answer, but I, I'm, I'm really curious what you think about it. I've heard an, very, very different opinions about it. Yeah, that's an interesting context to the question because um, I wasn't expecting to be asked quite that. Um, does it exhibit you values? Probably in general the answer is no. And I don't think it's an abusive book. I think clearly what's happening, my background's in social work, I do think it's clearly triggering people. Um, I think clearly people who um, are reacting strongly and are calling it abuse, I think clearly have something in their background that it's triggering. I do not think, my opinion is, I don't think anyone is going to be led into an abusive relationship as a result of this book. Um, in fact, I was introduced to this book. I was living in South America, in Colombia, hardly a sexually repressed country, and all the housewives were reading it in Spanish. So I had no idea anything about it. I see this book everywhere in Spanish, and I realize it's actually initially in English. Um, we were ta everybody was talking about it in dinner at dinner parties. The husbands thought it was hysterical. So I read it. Yeah, it's a terribly written book. You can absolutely say that about it. I think it's also the criticism I can't help but think is a little bit condescending to women. The idea that um, you know women don't know what they like and they're clearly not seeing how abusive it is. I, I don't even think it's representative of the BDSM lifestyle. So that's my spiel on it. But I don't know. I don't think it holds up UU values. But I don't know that any romances of this genre would. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm curious if other people have responses to that, or if, if you, uh, Nori, I know you've spoken and written some. You are muted right now, Nori. Nori is probably saying something very profound well, into her muted microphone. While, while Nori unmutes, I, I wanted to, um, to talk about the fact that I actually have uh, led, uh, gone through training for a seventh to ninth grade owl, and was the the lead teacher in a team of I think there were four of us that kind of rotated, and it was for the entire church year, uh, so we did the whole thing um, in depth, and I found it uh, an incredible experience. Um, I learned a lot. Some very interesting questions came from uh, from the youth that were taking it, which was really fantastic. Um, the, it was interesting to watch as we went through the year to watch them become more comfortable. We also had a, a really interesting spread. We had the, a, a huge a class that was too big. Um, we kind of broke the mold, and they after that the church divided it up by grade. But we had seventh grade boys and ninth grade young women. So you can imagine, yeah, it was it was a really <laughs> it was a really interesting mix. But what was so great about it was to watch them sort of come together and um, you know just be willing to to delve into this into this really interesting topic um, and to bring what they knew from school right into Sunday morning. Uh, we had some that were not UUs uh, and some that were, most of them, I think most of them were UUs. Um, and, and for myself, as someone teaching this, I felt that uh, 
although it, it is secular, I felt that I was actually embodying and living our UU values by teaching it, which is a sort of interesting way of looking at it. So it wasn't, you know, specific, oh, how does this, you know, correlate to, you know, one of our principles or whatever. But at the same time, you know, I, I felt like I was modeling what it meant to be a UU and to be able to talk about this. And one thing that I'd like to share is that some of our youth that had gone through it became what they called the go-to at their high school. So if people really, really wanted to know the truth, they would go to someone that they knew had taken out. And I absolutely love that. <laughs> That, that often happens, that, that our um, OWL graduates become um, de facto peer educators. Um, I'm actually, I'm glad that you mentioned the age spread. We actually recommend not having that three-year span in any of them, so that you'd have either seven and eight or eight and nine, but not seven and nine together, because <clears throat> often once young people get in high school, their discourse is all about who's having sex with whom and how they're having sex, and the seventh graders are like, I, I'd love to just kiss somebody, or I, you know, so, you know, so that's why we, we recommend against that. My, I wanted to get back to the Fifty Shades thing. Um, well, <clears throat> um, Mike, I'm not, I, I don't know that anyone is going to enter into a, a purposely enter into an abusive relationship because of the, the book or the movie. My concern, and my concern is not necessarily with older people seeing it because they have life experience that they can bring to the viewing of it. My concern is more with teens, you know, when it gets online, they could watch it online or on Netflix or whatever. My concern is that teens might see this as a healthy relationship and um, that before people get into a sort of power play in their relationships, they need to learn what it means to be equals in a relationship. And if they model their young relationships on this Christian Grey and Anastasia character, that's not that's not a healthy situation. Um, <clears throat> in you know, as, as an adult, you can play around with whatever you want, but maybe when you're forming your relationships, it's better to learn it on a more even, equitable keel. That's that's my thinking. That's uh, what I've heard is the what I would say the the major. Um, criticism that I would agree with is how the impact on younger people however the Twilight series was was pretty icky as well I actually couldn't make it through the first book I tried but uh, I do think that um, young people I mean that's one of the advantages of OWL is we we have them learn how to be comfortable talking I think um, it was the 7-9 OWL this year said one of the first things the kids said well this is uncomfortable to talk about one of their concerns that they divulged in the beginning. We are like, oh, well, yeah, it is for everybody. And um, that's where you start getting an edge on your, on your life, really, is when you can start um, having enough uh, uh, practice, uh, saying words, thinking concepts, um, having language to express what, what you want in an equal relationship. And so I, I think the OWL curriculum really is an antidote <coughs> to watching um, or reading Fifty Shades of Grey or, or the Twilight series or whatever. Um, and, and they can be useful as an example of a relationship that doesn't have the qualities. I think, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Twilight series because I do agree that that's, um, the relationships in, in that series are equally imbalanced. But for Fifty Shades of Grey, to me, and I only read the book, I haven't seen the movie, and I only read the first, I don't even think I finished the first bit because it was so poorly written. But it's not, I think for me what I got from that is it's this author writing out a sexual fantasy that's in her head. I mean, it's not even meant to portray real life. It's not meant to portray relationship. It's her fantasy. I, I don't, I mean, just the fact that Anastasia is a college graduate who has never even masturbated. Come on, that's. That's fantasy. That's his fantasy of this pure virgin snow that, you know, now is going to, Christian Grey is going to take over. But that's not meant to be a real relationship. Probably any more than most of our sexual fantasies, we wouldn't really want to see played out in real life. But in, it has a fantasy. They're fabulous. So um, so for me, I think, and I agree that it's, it's important to make that distinction for young people who might not get that. 
there's so much other stuff out there that is equally um, not, you know, most good books aren't about healthy, equal relationships because that's boring. So when we want to see something spicy, we see something that, that, that pushes the edge. And I, you know, I don't think it, I mean, the one thing that it does model for real life BDSM relationships is the contract where you say these are my limits, this and not that. Uh, but other than that, I just think it's a fantasy that she just wrote out. And so it's not meant to be a real relationship. It's certainly not, you know, meant to to be an abusive relationship. It's it's a it's a, it's just a fantasy. So I, I kind of get impatient when people say, "Oh my God, this is so abusive." Well, it's a fantasy. <laughs> That's all it is. Can I? I have a question for um, Millie and Melanie. Why why do you think, or and Nori, I suppose. Why, I'm puzzled as to why this book has gotten so much angry backlash. I, th I think Twilight is much worse for young people. I'm, I don't even think the same. I think worse, and I think there's a lot, a lot of things out there. So what is it about this book, this series, this movie that is so? I mean, I don't, even, I don't even have that much energy about it. I think it's more funny than anything else. But I, not the, the books themselves. So I, what is it that's really? I don't know. What is what is all this energy about? Why is there so much around it? Well, in part, it kind of depends on which which bloggers you're reading and what where their energy is. So that if you read a feminist blogger, uh, the commentary is about the inequity of the male-female kind of relationship and that power. Um, <clears throat> um, if you read a, a BDSM bloggers or people who are in that community, they're angry because their community is being misrepresented. Um, yes, they have a contract in, in this book, but he ignores it. Um, she has no ability to, to change her mind or say no, which is absolutely not what happens in the BDSM community. So I think, I think there's just, it, the energy just depends on who you're reading um, and the lens through which they, um, they saw it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, I, I did want to comment on one thing that, that Nori, the comment that you made about uh, no, everybody masturbating by college, they don't actually. I work, I do private conversation, uh, consultation with a lot of older women who have never experienced orgasm and they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s because they haven't touched themselves. Um, so that that part of it <laughs> you know, may not be fantasy. Um, to, um, which actually I wanted to share that um, we're currently working on Owl for Older Adults. Um, and we'll be talking about things like self-pleasure because whether somebody has gone that far in their life, 50 and above, without self-pleasuring or they've lost a partner um, and just would rather be solo sexual than, than partnered, um, it's an important thing to talk about. So that, that's going to be one of the things that we do include in Owl for Older Adults. I think that's great, and I, I want to say that I'm so excited that my church is right now just beginning the young adult owl, and we're and then we're on on we're going to start the adult owl like next month. So I'm very excited about that because I do think a lot of adults, um, you know, we are educating our kids so that they know more about healthy sexuality than, than their parents do because they didn't have that opportunity growing up. So I think that that's great for owl. I just think in the context of this book it's important that she be like this virgin, you know, this complete untouched. I'm not, I certainly don't think that everybody masturbates by the time they pick college. I think it's a different era now that probably more do than, I, it might have been more common for people in their 50s or so to not masturbate because it was taught to be so simple uh, that they took that very seriously. Um, and, I, and I also think that, um, uh, that people, like, I agree with what you said about what blogs you read in terms of who thinks what, but what's fascinating to me, what I think the housewives in South America or in the United States are reading it is because it gives them a different lens of their own sexuality, which again, they didn't get, they didn't learn about when they were young, they didn't have owls, so to see something, I just saw a meme on Facebook that said uh, nine months from now, there's, so there's going to be a, another baby boom called the Shades of of gray, 50 shades of gray baby booms because they're all having sex now. So, uh, 
Aisha, you were wondering what Gia thought of Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't know. Um, I didn't actually read the books. I did read the Twilight series when it was really popular. And, like, from what I hear, it, and, like, what you're discussing, I would agree that it is very fantastical. You know, like, he's super rich, and, you know, he's, like, a billionaire or something. And, but, and, like, so I can see the fact that it is very fantastical, but then, in a way... Our whole American dream is pretty fantastical, you know. Like <laughs> all the things that we watch on TV, the big explosions, the bank robbing, the huge houses that are supposed to be, you know, for poor people. You know, it's like that's all fantastical too. And so I feel like when we're trying to, when looking at things like that and reading things that are, that seem very fantastical from like our lens point, when you're experiencing them as like a young person who's trying to figure out what you're supposed to want in the world. And all that you see is like super fantastical. Then, like, how are you going to form I your have ideas, say, your your values around sexuality? I have a young woman in my life who um, had not read a book. She's in her probably late thirties, early forties. hadn't read a book since high school. Um, could not put them down. Just stayed up all night, and and has not stopped reading. So, you know, when you start. There you go. I'm curious um, with the new revisions um, about the social media. Last night, we just, G and I heard something just go by on NPR that said they'd done a survey of 20 year olds, and most of them liked social media better than sex. Oh, and 60% of them thought coffee was more important. Coffee. <laughs> so I just thought. What are they, who are these 20 year olds that they serve? I have no idea if it was legitimate, but I thought that is just interesting. I mean, <coughs> you, uh, you talk about the social media. Um, I'm just curious how those conversations go. Well, I have something I, to that. Is, is sexting or um, uh, included in. Yeah, I see, see some nodding, so. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we do discuss in um, uh, in the the workshop is this idea that they that uh, well we start with the internet and um, the the author borrowed this concept <clears throat> of the internet is like a big city that there are places in the city that are fabulous and wonderful and then there are places in the city that you just don't want to go because they're unsafe or they just make you feel icky. Um, and so that's to kind of get the young people to think that, yeah, there's this big old internet out there, but I have to use my judgment and my values about where I'm going to go. And the, then that carries over into the texting and sexting and social media part of it, that there are some things that I just don't want to do. I don't, it's not safe to be interacting with complete and total strangers. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're proud that you have 900 friends on Instagram or whatever social media platform you're on, um, but you only know really maybe 20 of them closely, do you want to be sharing pictures of yourself half naked or talking about where you were or who you want to date or whatever? So this concept of, you know, let's, let's think about your privacy and, you know, the respect that you have for yourself and for other people. I mean, some of that gets lost in this um, I got to share everything kind of moment. Um, a startling statistic that I read <clears throat> was about, and I don't remember the exact number, but it was about the many people who actually text during sex. And I'm like, well, it, that's not that, then that's, that's just getting exercise. You know, you might as well be on a treadmill. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Are those like work texts or? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 so you know and and when I wonder when people are saying I like my social media more than sex, what has their experience with sex been? Has it been a quick hookup that was not sexually satisfying? Was it a quick hookup that was satisfying? Was it a romance? You know, or or have they not had any kind of physical intimacy to speak of? So we don't really know where these people are coming from when they say they'd rather use their social media than have sex. Yeah, I think this relates to, uh, and this goes back to the, the Fifty Shades of Grey conversation about what kind of norms does society create and how does the internet contribute to that? And, you know, 
pornography on the internet is getting more and more violent and mean spirited and and degrading. And uh, but the other odd thing is that now the internet is here, and I'm holding up my iPhone for folks who are listening on their iPods. Uh, uh, and it used to be like if you had one computer in the house and you wanted to look at porn and you had family members around, well, you couldn't do it. But now you can pretend that you're looking, you're checking your texts, and you're actually looking at pornography and and. And it's sort of the thing about online pornography is it's kind of a race to the bottom. Like there's this 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 norming and de-eroticizing quality that because of the repetition, I think. And then that and then people are looking for weirder and weirder. I don't know, you know, more provocative uh, images to that they can be eroticized to, uh, and that are really making conventional like real life sex, like. I don't know. Is it is it not no longer compelling anymore because you know fourteen uh, year old boys get to watch eight hours of like seriously bad pornography a day? I was talking to a young woman who broke off an engagement because um, her fiance liked porn more than her. I mean, he you know it's so available at all times. It it always has been in a way, but she just. You know, she came to me and said, you know, what are you going to do about pornography addiction? And I was like, nothing. But, um, I mean, I, I wonder how many relationships it is really. And she was young. She was just out of college and, you know, thought this was it. So I, um, are there are there trends in pornography? <laughs> is, is there more now that it's on the Internet? Is it? Well, one of the things relates back to what Asia was saying about the, the book Fifty Shades being a fantasy. And when we pick up a, a book like that, or if we watch a film like Fifty Shades with any kind of awareness of that, then you know you can see it in a more ha 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 entertainment kind of way. Um, with porn, one of the things that that often people don't, younger people don't realize, and um, is that it is entertainment. It's created to entertain, and more than that, it's created to make money. So the sex that's had, the lights that are on, the bodies that are waxed and bleached and enhanced, that's all part of the show. So when they try to then, you know, relate that to themselves or their own bodies, <clears throat> um, how they should look, how they should act, how they should sound during sex, you know, it, it can all become scripted. And then, you know, maybe for some people it's just too darn exhausting to have to keep up that level of, of performance. Um, and it's not just young people. Um, I do sex and cancer workshops and um, sometimes the, the men who've had prostate surgery will be sad because they can't ejaculate or, or uh, the way they did when they were younger and sometimes they'll say, you know, I, I, can't, I can't come like a porn star. I'm like, well, nobody can, <laughs> you know. That's all lighting and camera angles and camera speed and body doubles. And so let's let's subtract that fantasy from the reality and then let's further subtract what your body would normally doing it be doing and capable of at age 70 from the cancer. So there's all these little bits and pieces that we have to help people understand and porn is just you know, part of it. But you know, if, if all we do is help people understand that porn is created for money and entertainment, that would be a, a, a good thing to educate people about. You know, I do. I'm so excited to hear that you're working on Owl for the older people. Um, I've gone into um, the women's perspective uh, committee meetings and uh, had um, conversations with the women about. Uh, sexuality issues, you know, meetings, two hours, uh, no big deal. But I have just been inundated with older people, um, sometimes uh, widows, sometimes single women, sometimes married women who are like, um, you know, we're having these issues. And, and it doesn't feel like there's any place they can talk about it. And uh, partly being older, uh, partly being known in the church for doing sex ed stuff, um, I'm a resource, fortunately, that they feel free to come and talk to. And I've been looking for resources to uh, to lead classes for particularly older women. Uh, and and frankly, then when I'm in a group with men and I talk about this, a lot of the men are saying, "Yeah, I would like that too." Um, and it 
it's a it's a generation that are are tend to be a little more private. They haven't had this, you know, expose all stuff in their life a lot. And so it's a little more well, and they haven't had the years of owl to learn how to be comfortable mm -hmm. talking about it. So all the way around, they're just um, uh, they're just hungry for this. And I I would I would love to see a, a really good curriculum for um, older folks. And 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 the owl, owl the uh, older adult owl is is good as far as it goes, um, but it it doesn't go nearly far enough in my opinion. So I, I have a slightly different question. Um, I'm wondering whether uh, you have any information about how OWL contributes to the growth of our churches, of UU churches. I've, I've heard this anecdotally that it's a great way to bring in, um, you know, it's just to bring in the community. But I wondered if, if anybody had any sort of either good, good guesstimates um, and I'm also wondering if you have great case studies about how a church sort of publicized it, you know, to the community, to their community that they're in. Um, I don't know that anyone has conducted studies that correlate church growth to OWL. Um, we know that we have uh, we have over, just over 200 trainers across the country who are, you know, creating new facilitators. Um, over the years since OWL came out in 1999, we've trained 8,400 facilitators. They're not all busy in action in churches now, but um, you know, it would be an interesting study for somebody to do to see. I, I know in my own congregation in New Jersey, um, we have um, we have we do welcome non-members to participate in OWL. Um, and I think there's been at least one family that joined because of it. Um, but certainly not every non-member who's taken an OWL class has, has joined. <clears throat> but I think to, to, to Millie's point, if you become sort of the go-to person or the go-to congregation, um, whether it's sex education or you're a welcoming congregation, um, which is certainly a, you know, a part of the overall sexual health of a congregation, um, those things can only only help um, grow a congregation and make it more vibrant. Um, we have about um, about a little more than 50% of our congregations offer OWL and um, that's a little misleading because a lot of congregations don't offer it because they can't. They don't have enough young people to form a cohort or enough older people who are interested in taking the adult class or you know, they, they don't have any adults who are willing to be trained to facilitate. So there are a lot of reasons why congregations may not do it. Um, so, you know, we can't really look at it that way. But, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Well, that gets back to that 7 to 9 or the, the, the grade span that we had that time, which that's part of the challenge is being able to find the trained facilitators and to have enough you know, have enough folks in a class to be able to do it, and all, all of those things. Oh I'm, yeah, and if you're in a if you're in an area where there are UU congregations or even UU and UCC congregations in proximity, then you can combine, and it eases the burden on any two facilitators to bring in two more from another congregation, it, and it teaches the youth to to mingle more and hear new perspectives. So that can be really good, but. Again, a lot of our congregations are isolated enough that that's not an option. Are you aware uh, of anyone who's taught it online? <clears throat> no, no, and we don't. Um, we're we don't have any intention to do that. At least with the younger ages, we've talked about it. We've had requests for it, and it's you know it's something that if I think if we were to experiment with it, we might want to experiment with uh, the college um, age curriculum. But so much of OWL is the interaction and moving through the space and creating posters and, and um, having dialogue in small groups and large groups. And I know online learning can be really wonderful. I'm, you know, it would just be um, a real shift in thinking about OWL. I have a question from um, the CLF fellow Elizabeth Buki. She 
It's interesting in hearing folks talk about UU values and burlesque, and I'm reading from my phone, not watching pornography. Uh, she says, her experience is that amateur burlesque can be a place for sexual empowerment and welcoming a variety of bodies, but watching professional burlesque makes her feel icky. So what do folks think about burlesque? I have a friend who's part of a UU congregation in the Twin Cities, and um, she uses burlesque to, like, like one, just like feel more comfortable with their sexuality, but also, um, as uh, a larger woman, she like is feeling a lot of empowerment over her body, uh, with her body, um, doing that. And so that's pretty cool. So it's both personal as well as political. Yeah, yeah, and and just like and like you know how she shows up into EU spaces and the the love that she brings and. The, the acceptance that she brings, you know, I think is increased by her acceptance of herself and burlesque increases that and so that increases her acceptance of other people. I've only... I, go ahead, Nori. I've only ever seen amateur burlesque, I guess, and that was at a rally uh, to, um, to empower women who had been raped, actually, and it was a way of using the bodies to, to take ownership of their own bodies and to not let, the, let our bodies be colonized by uh, societal mores and expectations. And the same thing is true, I have a friend who was into belly dancing, and the same thing is true, it's a way for her to reclaim her body and its movements and make it her own. I think um, I've, I've seen um, professional burlesque and amateur burlesque, and um, I think that one of the things that burlesque tends to be um, joyful, uh, a celebration by the people who are dancing it and uh, performing it, and it's sort of like, here's my body, I'm going to get joy out of it, I hope you get joy out of it too, um, and there's often a lot of humor expressed in, in the performance as opposed to some venues where um, people are paying to just look at someone to get turned off, you know, for their own gratification, not caring about the person who's performing. So it's a very different um, uh, sensibility about the performance. And I'm not, I would never denigrate somebody who is stripping for a living. Um, it's just the different types of performance and um, Certainly, I think there can be a lot of joy um, in that kind of performance. <clears throat> Would you oh, see sorry, it differently between, between uh, men and women? You mean like the Chippendales versus... Um, um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I think... Um, I, don't, I don't know. I have never gone to a place and seen male dancers. I've seen them on TV, but I, I haven't been in... So I, I don't know them. I, I know some burlesque dancers personally and have been impressed by the spirit with which they enter their, their performance. Seems like the trans community has also really stepped out with burlesque in interesting ways. Um, and I know we're coming to the end of our time, but it seems also to me like gender identity is one of the things that's just changed a lot since the original... Um, Owl was created in 1999 with just many more genders and, and much more development, people coming out a lot younger, a lot of kids, um, a lot of people in school. So I'll just flag that as well. That would be a whole other uh, conversation sometime. We are coming to the end of our time. Do, um, with our guests, do you have any uh, last words that you'd like to share with us before we end? I'd like to say follow along, hashtag sexuality, that's sex, U-U-A-L-I-T-Y, if you want to follow the bloggers conversation. I'd just like to say if you would have any, um, any inclination at all, um, join a, a training. You don't have to teach when you're trained, um, it, and it can be very personally enriching to get that training. Yeah, and um, I would just remind people if they are using the 7 to 9 curriculum, if they haven't purchased the new edition, please use the new one because the, the material in it is much more up to date and um, really we're very excited about it. 
And where would they find that again? At the UUA Bookstore, uuabookstore.org, under Church Resources. Well, thanks so much. You know, it feels like we just barely, barely touched some of the stuff we could be talking about. So we'll have to do this again. And we'll have to do it regularly because it is a place where I think that we have something to contribute to dialogue in a lot of ways. Um, I did want to mention that Joanna Crawford, who's not here, says that marriage equality has come to Austin. That's what she's dealing with right now. I don't know what that means. Obviously not Texas, just Austin, but that's exciting. She's been ready with a cowbell to ring for a long time on that. So hats, uh, cowboy hats off to Austin, Texas there today. Thanks so much to our guests and our regulars, and see you next week. Bye.